This is Reverse Engineered. Hey everyone, my name is John Penland and Reverse Engineered is brought to you by Kinsta, a premium managed hosting provider. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Adi Pinar, founder of Cogsy. Adi, welcome to Reverse Engineered. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. Well, thank you for uh, agreeing to hang out with us today. And to get us started, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, given the space that uh, Kinsta's in, I think most people um, might know me as uh, one of the original co-founders of, of WooThemes and WooCommerce back in the day. And then kind of a post WooCommerce, for me at least, I found another company called Converge, which was an email marketing automation uh, tool specifically for e-commerce brands and also kind of my first proper SaaS rodeo. I remember back in the day when building WooCommerce or Woo in general, um, always looking up at, at Campaign Monitor and what they were doing. So I sold that to Campaign Monitor in, in, in 2019, spent a bit of time with them. And uh, I now work on Cogsy, which is an inventory optimization platform, again, for e-commerce brands. So I've really, at least professionally over the years, I've stuck to something that I think I know well, right? Like become a bit of a, a one-trick pony in terms of you know, ultimately building, building software for e-commerce businesses. Right. Yeah. And, and I do want to get back to WooCommerce and WooThemes just a little bit. I know that's a few years in the rear view, but as you mentioned, we do host WordPress. And so certainly a lot of our listeners are going to be most familiar with your work from that angle. So we'll come back to that. But I want to start by talking about what it is you're doing today at Cogsy. So what is Cogsy? What is the core problem called Cogsy is trying to solve? Yeah, so we're ultimately addressing supply chain challenges that retail brands have, right? So I look at the challenges I have in a kind of a, in a tech or a software company, mm -hmm. and I feel very fortunate, right? So like the many, the many, many challenges that brands have around kind of you know, the shipping of goods, the list, you know, logistics around that, the operations around that. So like, and that's pretty kind of broadly stated in terms of kind of what we what we ultimately do. If you go to our website today, we essentially put ourselves as being your extra head of operations, and the idea there is mm -hmm. just that. There are some things that software is really good at and software is really good at like complicated math, doing it on a kind of consistent basis and ultimately finding those leading indicators to give you the opportunity to act proactively versus reactively. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to build. And I think as a simple kind of outcome there for you know anyone listening and that hasn't been in that position is like we ultimately kind of one of the core metrics that we report back to our our kind of customers is like a reduction in kind of out of stock days, right? So out of stock days mm -hmm. for any retail brand is like directly relates to lost revenue. And by using the various tools that you know, Cogsy has built, you're know, putting them into that kind of your know, proactive, consistent kind of you know, emotion really should ultimately kind of reduce those stock out days over time. Yeah. When I was looking at Cogsy, looking at your website, I was struck by the fact that my impression of Cogsy is that it is a fairly specialized product. It's not a mass market product. You're looking for retailers who retail online, who retail physical goods. And, and so it's a fairly specific niche. And, and that's interesting for me to think about because as we'll get into, you, you did, your background was with WooCommerce, which is in my mind, much broader, I think, than that very specific niche. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about the circumstances that led you to imagine this product, right? Because I don't view you as somebody with a background in physical products in this very specific niche. So how did you come across this specific problem and say, this is something you want to try and solve? Yeah, so that's a good question. So when I, uh, all these years ago, I essentially kind of majored in accounting at the university mm -hmm. um, and, and it was ultimately at university that I built the first product that became Woo and eventually kind of you know, uh, evolved to WooCommerce. But like A, I think that kind of that accounting hat or that accounting persona has always been a part of this. And then what happened, John, is in the last couple of years, my wife kind of built and then sold an e-commerce brand of her own. I was always her technical and kind of financial co-pilot in the business. I was never operational. But I could at least see how hard it was for her and her team to essentially kind of really wield the kind of the, the powers of the tools that were available to them, right? Mm. And I think the interesting thing there um, is that what most people don't know about me is part of my initial kind of motivation for kind of working on Woo and then you know, ultimately working on WooCommerce has always been this notion of, can I take something that's truly sophisticated and powerful 
and democratize it to an extent that it's accessible for a broader audience, right? Which is mm. kind of what I think we did for themes back in the day, you know, where the kind of granddaddy is custom development and we ultimately made themes more sophisticated at a price point that was more accessible. And we ultimately did it for, for WooCommerce. And then to come back to kind of Cogsy and this experience that I had, you know, being that co-pilot in my, in my wife's business is th there's a very kind of big gap between, of tools available, right? Like, yes, there are many of these kind of very sophisticated enterprise level tools available for mm -hmm. the biggest brands. The reality is that most of the brands are stuck in spreadsheets and a spreadsheet is, it's a great tool for many, many, many different things. And there's no way for us to completely get people out of spreadsheets, but that's what Cogsy is trying to do, right? It's, it's trying mm -hmm. to build a yeah. alternative to your spreadsheets and essentially kind of you're focusing on the things that makes software really good, right? So like one of the examples being in a spreadsheet, regardless of whether you're doing it for inventory data or something else, if your, like your data gets outdated constantly, right? Sure. So whereas yeah. if you had a specialized tool with connect data sources that keeps data kind of in sync, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, without, without rambling there, but I mean, those are the kind of the, the, the common threads and at yeah. least how I got to the point where I was like, this, this is a problem that's big enough for me to, to tackle. And I have enough mm -hmm. historic, um, just, well, just experience, um, whether from the yeah. WooCommerce side or, you know, or my accounting experience or my experience kind of being this co-pilot to my wife's business to be able to, to tackle this, even though I've never been an operator at a, a at a retail brand. Yeah. Uh, the, the onion I'm going to keep peeling at here for just one more mm -hmm. question is, did you encounter a retailer selling physical products who was running into this problem? Because there's sort of this truism of building SaaS, which is don't build a product and then go look for a solution, right? Or go look for a problem that it solves. You, you start with a problem and then you solve it. And and what's what's a mystery to me is how, you know, someone with a background that from my perspective, it seems to be very software focused. Yeah. How did somebody with, with that background and, and even, it sounds like your wife had a software business that she sold. How did you be, just have the visibility to see this problem? Wh where did it actually sort of come into your life? So you said, oh, there's a problem here that can be solved with software. Yeah. So one correction there, my wife's business was a physical retail business. Um, ah, there so you go. like that's, okay. that's where I got, got some of that. I actually think the more interesting thing here, John, is that I, at least for Cogsy and maybe to some extent Convergio that was the predecessor here for me, at least I did things that I would not recommend first time founders do, right? Like first time founders, sure. like I, like I always recommend, like do the customer development beforehand. Don't believe that you kind know, of, you can build it and they will come, right? Like we've all heard right. that kind of, that, that cliche thrown out. With Cogsy, it was more a sense of understanding that there is a problem there. Mm -hmm. And then being able to say, you know what? I, I've been successful enough to have diversified at least my financial interests that I can be slightly riskier here. I think how that plays out is I'm very clear about what game I'm playing, right? When I pitch my investors, I tell them I want to build the NetSuite killer, right? The NetSuite last okay. time I checked yeah. is, a, is a multi-billion dollar kind of business, right? So for me, it is a mo kind of moonshot thing. Like I, I don't wow. just want to build. And when I say this, I don't mean that in a disparaging way to, to other bootstrapped or lifestyle founders, whatever kind of labels were. I, I'm fully on board with any of those. Mm -hmm. I'm just very clear about the game that I want to play here. I, I, I yeah. want to build a, a category defining tool. So I think there's that mm -hmm. risk, but coming back to kind of how that plays out in the short term is it essentially means I can build the first version of a product and that becomes the line in the sand from which I kind of work and have those initial kind of, you know, customer conversations. So I'm already being opinionated and I'm trying to push mm -hmm kind of this project into a specific direction versus just being completely curious and saying, Hey John, like you are theoretically the kind of ideal customer that I would love to build for. Yeah. Can you tell me about your problems? And I keep my right. opinions out of that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the safer way to do it. Like it's a more mm -hmm. cautious or conservative manner to do it. But as I said, like, I, I'm very clear about that game, which is why I skipped that first part of doing extensive customer development, like typically yeah. lean startup methodology stuff. Right. I skipped all of that built the first version and just kind of iterate from there. Yeah. And I, I do think your background there in entrepreneurship and your, as you mentioned, sort of financial stability outside of Cogsy, personal financial stability outside of Cogsy are important 
sort of uh, footnotes, you know, for listeners to be aware of, right? Like this is a moonshot approach and that's awesome. 80s in a specific circumstance yes. that allows him to do that, allows him to take that sort of a risky bet. So that's awesome. Uh, I am curious because as you've described, you've been very intentional about what it is that you're shooting for at Cogsy, right? And that leads me to ask what it is you actually do at Cogsy, because I have to think you've been similarly selective in, in what you choose to actually spend your time on. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think the, the, the biggest change, and I should know this because I, I drafted the tweet about this in the week, I've not published yet, but in reflecting almost those step changes that I've made in terms of the kind of leader I am from Wu to Converjo to where I'm at today, like with Cogsy um, and my team. So with Wu, like the way I see it, it was very much about like learning as we were going and like learning for the first time, right? Like I, I needed to learn lessons. That was the first rodeo. With Converjo, it really was about how can I take those learnings and improve upon them, right? Like how can I stress test them? To what extent can I replicate them? Which things are universal and work and which were just very specific to Wu, for example. And with Cogsy, it has almost come full circle in the sense that I now want to use those lessons and I want to empower those individuals around me in terms mm -hmm. of kind of, you should now use those lessons. Like I should not be the only one learning or applying those lessons anymore. So I'm much more of a coach and a mentor today than I was previously. And I think like that's been a big change for me. And like, to your point, like, yes, that was very intentional. Conversion was a life-changing exit for me. It mm -hmm. could have been, could have been like, this is all um, obviously speculating, right? It, it could have been bigger had I figured out how to get myself out of the trenches and hire really great people that could push me forward on certain things, right? So um, sure. a concrete example there is, as a founder, I'm a generalist. So mm -hmm. there's, I can wear all the kind of different hats within, except for actually coding or writing code myself, but I'm also technical enough, for example, to understand, I, I can scope out a project and I can understand like API kind of limitations, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So I can wear most hats to some degree but some things I'm better at. Mm -hmm. And with Conversio, like marketing was that thing that I held on for too long. And I couldn't find that person that could come mm -hmm. in and tell me to a point where I could trust and be confident that, hey, AD, this is how we're going to do marketing. This is how we're yeah. going to grow the business. So, and how that then kind of plays out to where we're at today is like, hence why we've raised the money we've raised, right? Like that allows me to go hire those kind of more senior, more experienced individuals that I can surround myself with and they tell me what to do, right? Like, all I'm really doing is I'm always just kind of contextualizing that in terms of the bigger picture, right? I'm doing that and I'm being a coach and a mentor to, to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So like that's been a very intentional change and a progression from kind of both from Wu to Conversio where that changed again to where I'm at today and how I kind of see my, my role, especially in that function of being a business and a, a team leader. Yeah. So one of the things that I think whether someone is a founder or just a relatively high level leader in a, a growing company is that they have to master the art of getting themselves out of the day to day, as you said, or I think out of the trenches was the phrase yeah. you used. I'm just curious to, to ask in general terms, what has been your approach to getting yourself, so to speak, out of the trenches. I know I know at Cogsy, I think you may have designed it in from the beginning. So perhaps looking back a little bit further to, to some of those lessons learned at, at Wu or at Conversio, right? What are some of the things that somebody who's listening to us today or, or you know, myself as a, as a leader at a growing company, what are some of the strategies or, or approaches I can use to identify ways to get myself more out of the trenches? Yeah. <clears throat> I think there's only one that really comes to mind as a prominent thing, John, and it's the example I use here is the universal kind of recommendation here is to, to really find those truly talented individuals on your team that are aligned with your culture, values, mission, right? So high alignment there. And they will really shown anything in the realm of kind of in the, their ability to take initiative or responsibility, their thirst for learning, some kind of aspirational or ambitious quality, and then really backing them, right? And saying like, mm -hmm. hey, like what happens if I just step away from this a bit and see how they run, right? And I think yeah. how this 
kind of played out, the mo more recent example is, so my now co-founder in, in Cogs, he was my first engineering hire with Convergio. You can see when other in, like individuals in the team start listening to people, right? Like that's normally a good sign. Like, hey, here's a potential yeah. leader, right? Yeah. He was affectionately known as Papa Bear on our team, right? There was something yeah. that, that, that kind of the team, it happened organically, right? It wasn't, a, it wasn't an 80 thing that designated him you know, with this kind of role, and we didn't have a mm -hmm. kind of very strict hierarchy within Cogsy with titles and whatnot, uh, within Convergio with titles either. But it was a case over time of saying, here's an individual, can I give them some room to kind of grow into and see whether they take up the responsibility? And in Stefano's case, like that was the case. Like he mm -hmm. ultimately became that on the technical side, became that trusted confidant for me, where I could, I could go away, be offline for a whole week and know that there might be other challenges that pop up that no one on the team handles, you know, would be able to handle. But if the servers went down or someone got stuck on kind of a, you're pushing a new feature to production, Stefano would be that person that could solve that, right? But at some stage, I said, like, beyond identifying who those individuals are, you have to give them the space to... To essentially create that feedback loop where you are, you're able to trust them. Because I think that's a, mm -hmm. that's the thing. Yeah. Like founders are so like I, I know this is true for me, right? Like you, I I back myself, so I trust myself, which is that's the the mindset you're in. So you have to find a way of how do I trust someone else, and I don't have to second guess them and think like, ooh, I can do this better, right? Yeah. But to do that, like it's a bit of counterintuitive. Like you actually have to give them the opportunity to show you, hey, this is what I can do. Hence, you can trust me and step away. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I feel like I am learning right now is when you do step away, that you need to go ahead and anticipate that they're going to do things differently and, and not judge the merits of their work based on the fact that it's different, but, but to give it time to actually produce some outcomes. Because I think for me, when I hand off a, a task or back away and, and let someone take something on, if they don't do it exactly the way that I was doing it or would do it, I can have this internal reaction of, oh, this isn't working, right? I can have this immediate sort of gut reaction of, I, I don't know if this was a good idea. Maybe they're not going to be able to handle this. And then, and then they'll do it differently. And and it's, it's essential. I think this is what you were speaking to when you said you have to give it time to develop that feedback loop where you have to, you have to let go long enough to see the results of their work. You have to let it go long. You can't immediately pull it back if it doesn't go exactly the way you were expecting. Exactly right. Because if you take, take being a, a founder in a business, right? Like you're ultimately giving yourself like an indefinite timeline to make mistakes and figure things out, right? So, so why should that not be true yes. for someone else on your team that's stepping into mm -hmm. a similar motion of being the leader for a project or a, you know, an initiative or an objective, an outcome that you're trying to reach, right? So like, I think like it doesn't help if you give someone space and if after a week they make a mistake, right? Air quotes mm -hmm. for, uh, for those listening, make a mistake and you immediately pull it back, right? I think like that's, that's, that's a sure way of never being able to step out of kind of the trenches, right? Like you have to, I think that the motion there, and I got, I think I only understood this much later in my journey at Convergia as well, but you have to flip it from almost like being directive, right? And giving someone like, here's exactly what I need to do to a motion where you're keeping, you know, or holding them accountable, right? Mm -hmm. So like we often speak about the way we think about accountability within, within Cogsy today is very much like, I don't mind someone making a you know, mistake. Like that's not a problem. What is a problem is like, if you like don't put up your hand afterwards, A, and say, mm -hmm. Hey, mm, I screwed up here. This was a mistake yeah. or this was subpar. And B, like, what did we learn from this? Right? Like, cause there's either, and sometimes the learning is just like, mm -hmm. Hey, we experimented with this marketing campaign and it, it doesn't work. Right. And like, that's a kind of almost the end of the line like learning and that's fine. But then you retrace your steps from there and say, okay, like based on that, this is what we're going to kind of you know, try next, right? And like, then then the motion is creative. Other times it's like, ooh, this didn't work out, but here's a kind of almost a slight pivot or a slight tweak that we can make to rectify this, right? But those kind of the ability to learn, I think is much, much, much more important, which then mm -hmm. again means like, I think for, for me as a leader, like how do I foster that 
peer to peer accountability, right? Like where like peers can just on the team can just kind of have that feedback loop built in and say, this is how we, this is how we learn, right? This is how we do it. We learn and then we do, and then we learn and we, and we do. And then we just stay in that mm -hmm. motion constantly because that's a resilient, robust system that doesn't have a single point of failure, which is AD being in the trenches and like AD being yeah. the bottleneck on all initiatives. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea of accountability as opposed to necessarily being singularly focused on results. It's, Hey, if something goes wrong, do you take responsibility for the fact that something went wrong and do you learn from it? Right. And that that being a better measure than pure measure of, was it successful? Right. Yes. I, I love that. That's, yes. that's, that's a great idea. And, and I mean, I like, I'll add a little bit more color there, John, because like, okay, this is, uh, these are things that I'm very passionate about. Right? So I think at least with Cogsy, on most of the things that we work on, we don't direct anyone in terms of like what needs to happen, right? Like we speak in, in terms of this is the outcome that we're trying to get to, right? And the only non-negotiables there are like are our values. Like we have a, we've got a document, uh, uh, it's called Vivid Vision. There's a book by a gentleman uh, named Cameron Herald by the same name. And the idea basically is that like it's a three-year plan with loads of color and context as to kind of how you imagine your business team product, et cetera, to look like in three years time. And part of that is around kind of the values, the way you think like the, the state of truth for you as a, as a you know, company and a team. And ultimately those are, that's the guardrails, right? That's like, if everyone in the team operates within that, those guardrails, then I don't really care whether they zigged and zagged or walked in a straight line towards that outcome, right? I don't care whether they wore shoes or went barefoot. Like, I, like, like, that doesn't matter. Like, those were not important kind of points. And I think the the reason why I'm so passionate about that is I understand that there are many, many, many people in this world that kind of don't want to be an entrepreneur and don't necessarily want to have that, the fulfillment or the reward from, or that comes with complete autonomy, right? But I bet that most people have some inkling of that, right? And they mm. want, like, for some parts of their kind of work, they want input, they want influence, right? They want to matter, they want to be heard, right? And I think, like, hence why the, the, I think the broader you can kind of draw those guardrails and still have them kind of clear, like, these are the clear boundaries, that gives someone a lot of space to be creative and do their best work, like, be their best selves at work and do their best work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the, the way we try to express that idea is we talk about treating our team members like adults. We talk about not micromanaging and allowing our team members to tell us how that they, how they should be doing their work. That's how we sort of express a similar value. I don't think we fleshed it out quite as yeah. robustly as you did in your answer. I feel like I might make this, might, might be good to be highly recommended listening for a, a bunch of our team members. We follow the same sort of idea which is that we want our team members to have as much autonomy and flexibility as we exactly. can give them because we think that we think that actually produces better results in the long run. Yes. It produces happier team members who bring who produce better results cuz they bring their best ideas forward. They're not just ticking the boxes that we've lined out in front of them. Exactly, because otherwise it's like if you do that then um, I think you create that echo chamber um, of very homogenous ideas, right? Like if it's if it's only the top leadership, like setting direction constantly and how like things are done, it's not a very diverse kind of conversation that's happening, right? So you can definitely build a great business that way. I just think they can build a better business by involving more smart people, bringing their unique ideas and perspectives to the conversations. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I find happening quite a bit, uh, and I hope this comes across right. But one of the things I find happening quite a bit in my own teams is is somebody will come to me and, and I manage, just for example, I manage legal, IT, and HR primarily. Those are primarily the areas I'm involved in. And they might say, uh, hey, there's this new app that I want to start using. What do I need to do? And I'll go, I don't know, right? Like uh, you need to go, like oh, we have an IT manager, Eric, and he knows how to do this for sure. You need to go talk to Eric because I, I don't even know. Yeah. I, I know that there is a process and that's that's what I care about. I care that there is a process and that Eric has defined a process and written it down. But I don't, I don't actually know what that process is. Whenever I need to use a new app, I'm going to go find that process yes. and follow it. Yeah. The, the reason why that works is that empowers an individual, right? Like if you, if you illuminate, like here's the resources, 
here's the kind of, here's the things you can do. Like they're empowered, right? Which is a very solid foundation for anyone to then go out and do their kind of best work, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we do need to uh, move on to other topics. And I do want to, I do want to talk about your background at Woo Things, because like I said, you know, as a company that does a lot of business in the WordPress space, our listeners are definitely going to be most familiar with you from that background. So uh, just in, in brief, can you tell us about Woo Themes and the process? I think most people are going to best know you for your involvement with WooCommerce. So the founding of WooThemes and then the eventual launch of WooCommerce. Can you give us the Cliff Notes version of that process? Yeah, so <clears throat> all the way back in uh, 2006, 2007 is when I think the, the concept of premium themes kind of popped up. Um, and premium at that stage was really just our way of saying, because there was the free themes already existed and premium was our, like, we could have just said paid themes, but no marketer mm -hmm. would ever like that. And I think there were, there were a couple of us and one of the gentlemen's names is completely blanking on me now. But it was myself and Brian Gardner, who's now with WP Engine, after working on Studio Press and a couple of other things over the years. And we started up at about the same time, just as freelancers, right? And I, I had a popular blog at the time. I had a bunch of you know, free themes. And I just built this first product and I started selling it. It was called the Original Premium News Theme. That's where that was the name. And it was just the premise of you know, WordPress, had, I think, had shown an early kind of inkling that it wasn't just a blogging platform. It could be a CMS, mm -hmm. a complete CMS. Mm -hmm. And it was very like these kind of your magazine, like websites, content, heavy websites became very, very popular at the time. And that's what it was. And through that, I connected with Magnus and Mark that eventually became co-founders you know, within Woo when we officially kind of shifted things off my personal website and decided on kind of Woo as a brand. And it was where I think mid 2008. And then the three of us really just had a lot of fun, like learning. I think the, it was a fascinating journey. Like this is not a humble brag, but the business grew so well over so many of the kind of learnings that one should probably mm -hmm. have within a business, right? That we ultimately had to much later on have to kind of try and fix. And then it's much harder. Like if you think through something like team culture, like it's much, much harder to do this later on than being intentional about and just kind of doing it at the beginning because old habits die hard. But then through that, we eventually kind of st really stumbled into this. And again, like just following our customers. I think for anyone that thinks back to Woo, kind of back in the day, I think the thing that we were most proud about was, I think the brand was quirky. I think we were really good at building product, but our customer support was, was absolutely excellent. And it was really kind of our ability to live very, very close to our customers that taught us or showed us that what customers started wanting was they want, they, they were buying these at that stage, the top selling category for themes was what we called business websites, which is just a mm -hmm. simple kind of, you know, kind of brochure like website. And they kept telling us like, Hey guys, like we would love to add a shopping cart to this. Can you help with this? Yeah. And uh, we looked around and we couldn't see something in the, in the ecosystem that we liked, meaning, mm -hmm. um, and our criteria wasn't functionally, could this allow someone to sell? I think. WP e-commerce at the time, I don't know whether it still exists, was the, the predominant player. And there was a plugin called Shop with two Ps, but neither of them would have allowed us to build really great looking themes, which was what we had built our reputation on. And we ultimately mm. embarked on this kind of process of uh, trying to build it ourselves and got close to you know getting a core contributor from WordPress working with us. That didn't work out, tried to build it internally we weren't technically strong enough. And then we really stumbled onto Mike Jolly and Jay Coster, who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, were working on, on Jigger Shop, which was a competitor at the time and ultimately became the fork for, for WooCommerce. So, and there's so many stories that I think that kind of the, the, the last thought that I'll share there is along the way, we made so many assumptions, John, about how we would build WooCommerce and the model, right? The initial model for us mm -hmm. was we would monetize it by selling themes like e-commerce themes. And Jay and Mike came in and they, like, we adopted this kind of extension led model and app store like model from them, which completely changed the business, right? Like within, and then within a year after kind of launching WooCommerce, WooCommerce related revenue became 90% of our business, right? So, but wow. Wow. much of that was not planned. It was really just us uh, staying in that discovery phase and seeing where it took us. Like it, it was a rabbit hole. And you know, today, today WooCommerce is what it is, right? But I think we would definitely be overplaying our hands if we said 
Like we were the strategic masterminds and right. we absolutely everything figured out. Yeah. So, so if I could, if I could paraphrase a little bit, it sounds like, it sounds like themes were your primary business and you had clients who were going, we want to add a shopping cart to these themes that you're making for us. And there was nothing on the market and you were like, all right, well, let's, let's build a plugin so that we can keep selling themes that have a shopping cart. And within a year, it was like, all right, the themes don't matter so much anymore, right? <laughs> the shopping cart is the business here, right? Like how, how quickly did you, and, and for, you know, perspective or background here, I, I didn't really come into the WordPress space until like 2014, 2015. And so by the time I showed up, WooCommerce was, everybody knew WooCommerce yeah. in the WordPress space, right? It was the, the standard for if you wanted to set up an e-commerce site. So what was that process of deciding, hey, we're going to, we're going to shut down the theme side of the business and focus on um, e-commerce, fo focus on WooCommerce. It was a very natural process, right? I think at that stage, yeah. like you see, like you see a very fast horse, horse in your business and you're like, well, like we should totally place more bets around that horse, right? Mm -hmm. And we actually tried, we, we didn't initially shut down the themes either, John, like we just siphoned off some resources from themes and we actually, we thought about, we tried our hand at building other plugins actually. And the way we scaled WooCommerce was by using third-party developers, right? That mm -hmm. could build yeah. very specific add-ons or extensions to, yeah. to the platform. So there's very kind of distributed, I don't say workforce, but distributed force to help us solve for all of those kind of edge cases and, and needs that merchants around the world and in different industries, you know, kind of needed from us. And it wasn't until I think... I would say two, two and a half years into the business where we actually looked at that and like, well, we like should have just focused on that. Like we, we should have probably mm. shut down themes and we should not have built these other kind of plugins. If WooCommerce wasn't as big, like they would have been material businesses in their own right, but they were so sure. tiny relative to what WooCommerce was doing that we should have just focus on that. But then you get into that yeah. challenge, which is the same challenge I think we had on themes, where, which is like, once you build something and especially within the WordPress community, like people expect support, yeah. right? Like you, yes. you've got them stuck on the product and it's very hard to take that away and deprecate things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's security considerations as well, right? Like something comes up and all of a sudden, you know, there's a security issue that wasn't, you weren't aware of in the past and that has to be addressed and you can't leave those users who were using that theme you developed six years ago, right? You can't leave because you still got a thousand sites out there using it, right? <laughs> you can't exactly, leave them hanging. Exactly right. And that, that was also before, like we eventually changed, I think just before I stepped down as CEO, like towards the end there, like we changed our like licensing, like and I think we started limiting it to a year, right? But before that, like yeah. that was the exact challenge that we had is Lifetime. You know, someone paid, paid you 70 bucks for a theme and seven <laughs> years later, they still want to bombard you with support questions right. and they expect a kind of an hour, kind of uh, no more than an hour to turn around time on a response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's absolutely uh, tricky to, to manage. I, I am struck. I, I've never really thought about the extensions element uh, or the add-ons element in the WooCommerce space and about, you know, where the e-commerce plugin market was at that time. But I'm struck that you probably actually froze some potential competitors out of the space by making WooCommerce something they could build on instead of them having to build something from scratch. Right. And, and I'm curious if you've ever thought about that, or I mean, was this a happy accident or was this a strategic choice, right? That <laughs> you froze out some competition in that yeah, way. Yeah, it's, it's totally happy accident because um, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think that that's probably true, right? I was chatting to, to someone yesterday that's now in a similar space to, to, to Cogsy, but the individual also had like his first start, like building an extension business for WooCommerce. And I use the example of the Skyverge team. The Skyverge team had a really great exit. Uh, and they did so exclusively based off, not exclusively, but on the back of kind of building WooCommerce extensions. And I, I have no doubt that they probably had at least the similar kind of you know, technical ability that we had with WooCommerce and they could have built a WooCommerce alternative, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it was compelling enough for them to rather build with us than yes. against us, right? Which is always a fascinating kind of you know, phenomenon in, in, in the open source ecosystem so mm -hmm. that makes sense in hindsight i cannot claim like being the strategic mastermind and right. having the foresight to, to to plan things out like that uh, all those right. years ago right well and as a as a you know developer who's an entrepreneur if you're sitting there looking at the space and you go i have a path to potentially having access to millions of woocommerce users 
that I can sell this $4 a month extension to. That's a much faster path to revenue than building a new product, yes. right? And so it becomes compelling, very compelling for other entrepreneurs in the space to build on top of what you build as opposed to building a competitor. Definitely a much more viable path for them because they have sort of this this predefined customer base that they can that they can try and tap into. Totally, and I like I I can't claim credit for for this approach. Um, a buddy of mine, Rob Walling, who's now a founder of Tiny Seed, previously founder of a couple of other companies, but he describes it as a, a stair step approach for kind of entrepreneurs. And the idea there is that. The, the easiest thing to start selling is perhaps an info product, some kind of your know, productized consulting, right? And then the next step up before like building your own kind of your SaaS business is a plugin or extension of some nature. And the reason for that is like, A, you can build a smaller product, right? You don't have to build all encompassing thing. Like you can, like in the case of WooCommerce, like they were very specific, like you could build geography support for kind of German stores, right? Mm -hmm. And serve a very small niche. So you can build a smaller project, but the marketing and distribution, the go-to-market strategy is also much easier, right? Like you're not building a thing and you have to figure out your own customer acquisition channels. You can piggyback off of the captive audience that the underlying platform already has. So like it, it is just easier, like as you cut your teeth as an, as an entrepreneur, like it's just easier building in an existing ecosystem on an existing platform versus something you know completely from scratch. So we've talked about kind of two big areas in your um, journey as an entrepreneur. We've talked about Cogsy, we've talked about Woo Themes and WooCommerce. The the third and and sort of final stone that I want to touch on in this conversation is a book that you published last year. So last year, twenty twenty one, you published a book called Life profitability. And I wanted to give you uh, the opportunity to kind of explain what that is to our listeners. So what's the central premise of that book? Yeah, I think that if there's only one idea that uh, I want any reader to take out of it is that um, our work or our businesses, right? Uh, if you're if you're an entrepreneur, should be there to serve our lives and not the other way around. And I think like just breaking that down, I I don't like the idea of like we work to live or live to work. Like I, I think both of those feel very binary, firstly. Um, secondly, I also don't like this idea of work-life balance. Like I think the idea of work-life balance proposes that you either work or you live. And I think work and our professional kind of endeavors is just a single part of life. So what I tried to do within the book was propose a kind of a different approach where you can do these things in life, whether it's work, whether it's some kind of professional um, endeavor or just other things in a way that is profitable in the context of your whole life, right? And for me, it's really, John, it's, it's been a case of being really aware of what those important things are in my life, right? I think in the same way that you would construct a financial investment portfolio, like I, mm -hmm. I have a concept of a life portfolio. And I know that for me, at least, there are concrete things. My family needs to be in there. My health needs to be in there. My business needs to be in there. I have ambition, right? But I also need kind of the the space and the time to learn. Like that needs to be in there. Like it's it's a, a softer or more qualitative kind of thing. But I need I know that if I'm going to stagnate in terms of my personal development for too long, I'm probably not a happy 80, right? And I'm not being the best version of myself. So it really just is around like firstly building that clarity um, around what that looks like and then trying to set up like create some space in your life and then set up your life in such a way that you can nourish every single aspect of those things you've identified in that life portfolio of yours yeah so is this idea of a life portfolio the idea that the things that are in your life need to contribute to sort of a healthy and a whole life is that where did that where did you learn that idea? Where did you develop that that concept? Is that something you've always, you know, since you were 17 years old, you were just this, you know, sage 17 year old, <laughs> no. or is this something that, that you developed at a later stage in your life, this idea? Yeah, so th definitely later stage. And I think they're kind of the, almost the kind of precursors to this is definitely kind of ha having failed miserably at some of those things in my personal mm -hmm. life, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's being a good partner to my wife or, you know, being a good dad to our kids or just being a, a crappy leader within the teams that I've built, right? So like all of those things are probably the precursor. So I, I felt the pain, right? Mm -hmm. But then very organically, John, what happened was within 
my team at Converger, probably about halfway through the journey, like we stumbled onto this language, which was, we are a life and family first team. And the idea was mm. just rooted in like, how can we just structure work to at least honor that beyond work, there is more meaning, right? And I think what we said is we want to do challenging, stimulating, fun work, but we have to acknowledge that the most meaningful experiences that we can have as individuals is outside of work, right? So i.e. with our families or going on vacation or whatever it was, I and mean, it probably is a very unique perspective. So, and we start doing small things within our team, which is if someone is on holiday, we will not ping them. We will not even tempt them to kind of come back into work unless like they are the only person that can put out this fire, right? Mm -hmm. So it became those small little disciplines, but the, the philosophy around this was what can we do as a team and a collective, as a company that would honor that unique individual to have that kind of your life and family first experience whilst working on our team? Yeah. What prompted you to write the book, right? Because I imagine you could have developed these ideas, you could have applied them to your own life, you could have applied them to the businesses that you're building, but you then opted to, you know, as a software entrepreneur, somebody who's been focused in that space, to go in a different direction and uh, write a, a book. I mean, I can go on Amazon and buy the paperback, right? Like to write a physical product. What what prompted you to take that extra step and try and put this idea out into the world in the form of a book? Yeah, mostly legacy. I think that's the the most predominant part or primary motivation for me was was legacy and specifically not <clears throat> like less so about the public and more so about like how at that stage I only had the, the two boys and we were fortunate to to add a, a little girl to to the mix very recently. But at that stage it really was like what what breadcrumbs can I leave behind for my boys that if something were to happen to me today and they were still young and they didn't fully grasp who their dad was, that they could actually pick up an actual artifact and mm. maybe learn a little bit about the more kind of nuanced parts of me if they wanted to, you know, kind of, so mm -hmm. it is very, I think, self-indulgent, right? I would never position that I'm doing them a favor in doing that. Like it was mm. around me, right? Like it, there's a kind of that, you know, somewhere on Maslow's hierarchy, the need to be relevant, right? And I think like, I would hope that if something happened to me today, that's kind of years down the line, like my boys would want to, my kids would want to learn more about their dad, right? Like that's the kind of, that's the, 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 the very personal hope. So, and I think book, a book to that extent, like is a great way of trying to accomplish that. So that very much is, I, I would say, you know, 67% of the consideration was, was that, and then there's other things, but that was definitely kind of the most personal, most prominent motivation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, AD, as we sort of wrap our conversation uh, towards a conclusion here, I, I do have a couple of wrap up questions that I like to ask all of our guests. So the first is, is there a resource that you think our listeners would find a lot of value in? It could be a, a book, could be a, you know, a blog, really anything. Is there something that you consume that you would like to recommend? Hey, go check this out. Yeah. So <clears throat> I recommend a book and the book's name is Siddhartha by an author called Herman Hess. And it's just a book about a journey. And I think okay. that there is, yes, it's been an inspirational book for me. And I, I think the, the, the key is the, the, the takeaways are like not what is promised on the cover. And this is a fascinating read for anyone that's on a journey. Okay, awesome. Well, we'll make sure and get a link to that in the show notes so our listeners can check that out. And then the last question for you today is where can our listeners go to find out more about Cogsy or to connect with you? Yeah, so best place to connect with me is probably on Twitter where I'm um, at 80, so 80 double I. Everything is linked up there. You can also find Cogsy from there. Otherwise, Cogsy is just uh, cogsy.com, C O G S Y.com. Yeah. Well, 80, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to, to hang out with us here at Reverse Engineer today. We've really appreciated having you on the show today. No, thanks for having me, John. And thank you to our listeners. That's all for today's podcast. You can access the episode show notes at kinsta.com slash podcast. That's K-I-N-S-T-A dot com slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Reverse Engineered and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or the platform you're listening on right now. See you next time. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Reverse Engineered, the podcast on all things business and tech. Reverse Engineered is brought to you by Kinsta. Kinsta's premium WordPress hosting can speed up your website by up to 200%. And you'll get 24-7 support from our expert WordPress engineers. 
Let us show you the Kinsta difference at Kinsta.com.